Welcome to the Melanin Jelly Project Conversations, a podcast that celebrates diversity and representation in children's storytelling, entertainment, and edutainment. I am the host, Olunos and Luisa Ivaze. On this podcast, I chat with authors and creators of children's books, entertainment, and edutainment. This is also a collaboration with the Ottawa Black Book Club. Now, welcome, Naya S. Johnson, the author of The Adventures of Mansa and Yaya, The Light Request. My name is Louis Olunosen Louisa Ivaze. I am the I'm an author and I'm the host of the Melanin Jelly Project podcast uh, Conversations, which is basically a podcast that celebrates representation and diversity in children's storytelling. I put together this podcast because I realized we don't have enough podcasts that celebrate representation and diversity in children's storytelling. So Naya, tell me about yourself and what inspired you to write this book. Yes, so I am a native of Greensboro, North Carolina, um, and I attended undergrad at UNC Charlotte um, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And during my time there, I participated in a community African history course. And so a part of that course was, you know, a group of people from the community. And um, there was one young man specifically who just took full responsibility and accountability for everything that he had been reading and researching and all of the knowledge that he obtained and sharing that, you know, with this community and this group of people. And we, it, it was called a course. It was not anything that was registered like with a university. And I think that's, really what made it so special and unique is that um, it was really just a coming together of the community to learn this. And so from that course, um, we learned about, you know, Mansa Musa and, you know, from having my son and, you know, named him Mansa and just was inspired by all of the rich history and just remember that feeling of um, empowerment and just enlightenment and knowing that um, you know, that was one of the first times, you know, growing up in the U.S. and education and history, that was one of the first times that I had really, really, truly learned about African and African-American people, the African diaspora, um, from like, you know, super beginning until like modern day. And so it was just a really enlightening and empowering experience. And um, even when we moved from Charlotte, I knew that I wanted in some way, shape or form to be able to continue to tell those stories and be able to continue to communicate what I had learned and in a way that was just really meaningful. I've always been super passionate about education and children. And so a children's book just seems like, you know, the, the perfect way in, in, to get in front of children and to tell these stories. And so that's what led to the creation of my children's book and, and of, you know, this series of stories that I'm hoping to create. Um, yeah. Okay. And I, in your on your in your author's note here, you said, "It is my greatest hope that every child who reads this book is empowered to keep on reading and learning. I hope they all feel surer of themselves than they were when they felt, when they started, knowing that everything they need to accomplish to accomplish great things already exists within, and they are kings and queens destined to change the world forever. I mean, for the better. And this is this is amazing. When I saw Mansa." I, I, I smile because from my <laughs> accent you can tell that I am Nigerian. So yeah. yes, as and I was born back home, grew up back home. But I realized that a lot of people also don't know enough enough stories are not told about the African history. And stories beyond slavery. Right. Yes, especially in the Americas. Our history didn't begin with in the didn't begin with slavery. We were kings, we were queens, we were jallies, we were scientists. In Kemet, a lot of people, you know, all the Greek, the Greek philosophers will tell you that they learned from Kemet. Egypt, mm-hmm. I think, was just the name of a temple. Yeah. And they brought this, they, they, they brought all that knowledge to, they took it to Europe, brought it to the Americas, and I don't know where things went wrong and, you know, yeah. and what happened. So, but it's beautiful that you've taken it upon yourself to write about, you say you named your son Mansa. That's yes. Cool because Mansa Musa was said to have been the richest man that ever lived. Yes. When I read about his wealth and the is what he cre- what he did back, I think in Timbuktu, the mm-hmm. lives and all that he had done, which I felt was really, 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 really amazing. So why do you think it's important to tell for our children to read these stories about these great people that once lived in Africa? 
I think it's important for children to, I mean, just growing up and coming of age, you start to connect with certain people and concepts mm -hmm. and ideas. And, you know, it, it could be good, it could be bad, you know, positive or negative. And so I think it's really important for children to find, you know, people of um, just of honor and royalty and, you know, empowerment and enlightenment. I think it's just super important for children to be able to have things like that to connect to. I think it's super empowering and um, it really helps them realize like, oh, I can do this thing or I can become this. And it, it, it really gives them something to believe in. Um, I know for me, like seeing, you know, certain people do certain things for, for uh, example, I've always been interested in like, writing and you know creative storytelling and, and so whenever I saw a black woman in that space it meant so much to me because you know as a little girl or even as you know a teenager it's like I can do that like someone who looks like me or has a similar story as me or a similar you know upbringing or the same you know similar friends or whatever like I felt like you know seeing people in those spaces that I could do those things and so I thought it was really important for, you know, to be able to create a book where children can see, um, I feel like kings and queens, especially in, in the minds of little kids, is just so granular, like it's so large, it's 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 such a huge concept. And so um, even when you, you know, think about Disney princesses or things like that, like that's just something that kids look at and um, they wanna be like, and they, they want to, you know, have the things that come with you know having this title or this this role and so i really just wanted them to be able to see something that they could connect with something that was positive something that was empowering and really gives them that sense of like not only you know do they look like me or have they done really great things but you know there's something about me too that that could be like them or that could do something like them to make a difference Okay. How important do you think it is for us to tell our authentic stories? Because for the longest time, the African literature we've had was told by other people. Mm -hmm. How important no, I, is I think it's super important. I think it's probably the most important. Ironically enough, I was just reading um, a story with my son a few nights ago, and there was something about, I mean, it was like, you know, it was, um, it was, I think... Uh, talking about Maasai people. And so as I'm reading the story, I was getting sort of a negative concept and, you know, it was complete opposite of why I was even picking up the book in the first place. And so um, I stopped reading, I looked up the author and I'm like, I don't think that this is an author that is representative of the people that they're talking about in this book. And, and she was not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's super important uh, that we tell our authentic stories and that we are the ones that tell those stories specifically because um, I think it just becomes completely misrepresented when we don't and when, when we allow others to create those stories. Yeah, I, I feel that if as, an, as a writer, I feel every writer can write about what they want to write about, but if as a writer you choose to write about a different color, I mean a different ethnic group, it is only respectful and honorable that you make out time to do your research well exactly. and tell the truth when you're writing. Because exactly. if, I, if, you, if you take a look at stories, like stories written way, way back, like in the 1800s, all the, the classics that we have, mm -hmm. I feel that people of other races were not properly represented. Absolutely. You know, there's a great misrepresentation of ethnic groups. Like, I remember as a child when I was growing up, I read three Gollywogs. Mm. Yes, and some would say there was also that other book, Little Black Sambo. I read that book too. Yeah. And you you, you, you think of the names, Little Black Sambo. Mm -hmm. Disrespect to derogatory. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important that we tell our authentic stories because we are talking from experience and not from theory. Yeah. I think when other people who are not representative of that ethnicity or those places tell those stories, they're intentionally leaving things out and intentionally like just making stuff up um, so that when we read these stories or when we share these stories with our children, that they get a completely different message. Um, and so I think that 
it, I mean, that kind of hurts me a little bit because it's, you know, to think that someone would do something intentionally as much as try to change history um, by rewriting something a completely different way is is damaging. But I think because of that, it's all, you know, the more important for us to tell those stories as often as we can. How important do you think it is for children to see themselves in books? Super important. Super important, especially when we're talking about from, you know, a very, very young age, encouraging children to read books and to love learning. Children want to see themselves in, in books and they might not, you know, flat right out say it like I want to see someone who looks like me in a book. But um, they do. They want to open a book and see someone who looks like them, who has the same story as them, who whose family looks like them, whose you know, friendship groups looks like them, who's school and, and things like that. They they want that. Um, and they need that as a part of, you know, their identity and, and, you know, how they feel and start to develop, you know, emotions about who they are as people. Okay. And here you have reading is your superpower. Yeah. You know, when I read, when I got to this part where you said reading is your superpower, it made me smile because as a child, I was a voracious reader. Mm-hmm. And those are the kind of things I'd like to read. I will always be that child in the library, digging out yeah. history books, just, but always reading something. Even as an adult, mm-hmm. I still, even though now with how busy life is, I still find time to listen to audiobooks. Yeah. But there is just something about knowledge. I feel that when you read, it gives you, it allows, I think it, it gives you, into, it gives you a peek into someone's mind and how someone thinks how someone reasons and it also teaches you about you are able to travel mm-hmm. just through reading you're able to travel you're able to experience you're able to taste mentally taste you yeah know, like you're reading about food and from the description of how it's prepared you can right. almost smell it <laughs> yeah you can yeah. almost uh, you can almost smell it so yeah. i'm just reading through this now and you went to you went you, you mentioned queen amina of um the warrior queen of nigeria i actually grew up in the city zaria yeah. city i actually lived wow. in the warrior city yes so you mentioned queen amina here and let me see mansa musa there is queen let me see if there's any okay yes there is queen amina i like that you you didn't only talk about a king, you also spoke about a queen. And Mansa, I think, means king. Yaya means queen. And then, from there, you brought it to the Americas. Huey Newton, and I think that I said it right, Huey, right? Yes. Okay, so Huey Newton and Bree Newsom. Yes. Yes, I like that. So how important do you think it is for us to tell our children about the great people from our cultures that did great things? It is super important. And I like how you noticed, like starting with, you know, the African kings and queens and bringing it to the Americas, because I was super intentional, you know, about doing that um, that way. Um, but I, I think it's so important. And I think it's important to give them a range of people as well. I think we can think of, you know, just in American history classes, learning about specific um, African Americans and people who made a difference, and but there's so many more people, and there are so many more stories, and so even I feel like I, I'm just barely scratching the surface with the people that I even mention here, and I wanted to be super intentional about that as well. I wanted to think about the way that I talked about them as more of an introduction um, for people to say, "Wow, like who is this?" Um, I want to learn more about them. And so just super intentional about that. But um, I think for us to just know that there are people who have lived in the spaces that we are living in and who have, you know, walked um, and, you know, overcome things, you know, living very similar, sometimes even, you know, harder lives than we are living. I think it's super important for children to see those people and to be able to say, who is this person? What did they do? Um, And to learn more about them. And so, yeah, very, very important um, to be able to see. And I, I don't think each of those people is perfect in any way, shape or form. I do think 
um, that even as we're thinking about learning these people and, and who we introduce our children to um, in these stories, I think it's important to consider that they may have done things that we, you know, didn't necessarily agree with or think were right. But I do think that it's important to introduce our children to these people so that they can learn more about them and learn more about who they are and their stories and still be able to see a little bit of themselves in each of those people. Okay. So what are the cha- some of the challenges you think that authors experience when trying to tell authentic stories? I think one of the main challenges is is thinking about, uh, I guess, the way that history is is just perceived um there's i think what is it three sides to every story there's your side my side and then there's the truth um so i think when you're thinking about especially telling about something historical i think thinking about you know what what will other people who understand some of the concepts and some of the background about this but maybe have a different perspective like how will they perceive this story and what What does that look like for me to tell this side of the story or this part of the story Um, for those people? I think whenever we write a book, like we want everyone to love it and everyone to think of it um, as something amazing and something that, you know, every child reads and and, and gets a hold of. But um, I think that there is a balance of like what really happened, what didn't really happen, like what's worth mentioning, what's not worth mentioning and and finding that balance to still give a story um, that is enough to, to spark an idea or to spark, hmm, I want to learn more. Or, hmm, I want to look into that. Okay. And how do you think that as Black authors, we can support each other? Yeah, how do you think we can support each other? Because I was going to ask, I was going to say, how do you think we can put our books out there? But I think, yeah, yeah but I think it's all part of the, it's all, all under the umbrella of support. How do you think as Black authors, we can support each other? Well, I think by having, you know, a podcast and a space like this is a major way to support each other, to be able to create space, to learn about, you know, the different books and stories that are are being um, put out there and and shared with the world. Um, So creating space and then also just finding ways to connect, whether it's Um, you know, reposting another author's book or an event that another author is hosting, even um, participating in, you know, author events together, maybe getting a booth or, you know, having your own booth or having a booth together at a a location and and really helping people to understand, like, this is a really great book, but this is also a really great book. I don't think that there is a one size fits all. I think um, you can have more than one favorite book and you can have more than one favorite story. Um, but yeah, finding ways to connect, creating space and just um, seeing each other as like part of this same community of um, creators and authors and um, writers and, and being able to just figure out ways to connect however you can. Okay. So what was your so what was your writing and publishing journey like? Because I noticed this book is self-published. So why did you choose to go the self-publishing route? Why didn't you go the traditional publishing route? Yeah, I think there are huge pros and cons with self-publishing versus going through like a national agency. Um, One of the things for me was like time. So I knew that I wanted to put this book out. I I wanted to put it it out even sooner than I actually did. It took me about two years to fully um, like publish it, but um the one thing with time was that I wanted to have like I guess the say so or the control of when the book was published I didn't want to wait for someone to think that my story was great and to um say like yes let's invest in this I also just I didn't really even want someone's initial buy-in to be the reason that I published. Like I wanted to be able to do it um, without saying like, oh, I did it because this person liked it or because this company. And I don't think that um, that's the case like for everyone who does dip go, you know, the, um, I forget, I guess what the other side of it would be, what it would be called. Um, but I don't know. I just, I guess my, wanting to control so many different variables even in terms of like the money and the revenue made from the book um I didn't want to take like a very small percentage of something that I had created and something that I felt like um I was a huge contributor to and so there were a bunch of different things for me and reasons that I just decided to self-publish and it just was the best option for me 
Um, and so, like I said, I created this story, it's, um, I guess, almost three years ago now. And initially, I was sort of trying to figure out, at the time, I was still um, obtaining my master's degree. And so, I didn't really have a lot of money to invest and a lot of, um, just a lot to invest generally. And so, I went with an illustrator initially, and I think I paid maybe $500. And um, I guess depending on where you go, it, it makes a difference in what you get with that. But I just was not like satisfied. I didn't look at the illustrations and feel like this is what I want. And so it took me a little bit longer. I did a little bit more research and then that's when I was able to um, find DG Self Publishing, which was directly aligned with everything that I wanted to do. I, I needed a team. Um, I needed a project manager to help take me step by step and illustrator to create very high quality illustrations. Um, I needed like a team of people who had the resources and the know-how about this is the next step in that process. And that's what um, DG Self Publishing was. And that's the, the experience that I received as a result of partnering with them. And so it just made sense to go that route, I was still self-published, like I was not, you know, at all attached or um, uh, like required to um, pay out a certain amount of money or royalties to them as a result of publishing my book. And so all of those factors just kind of like came into play. And, and those were things that I personally cared about as it related to, to figuring out what my self-publishing journey would be. Yeah, because I was gonna ask, uh, let me see. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I like the illustrations and I was going to ask how you found your illustrator and the connection you had with your illustrator because he did a good job. I like that he made them superheroes. It's the, the, the illustration is easy on the eye. It's catchy. Yeah. It's something kids would love to look through because kids are very visual, are very visual. So how did you find your illustrator? Yeah, so my best friend's sister, she self-published a book. Yeah. And when I got her book, I had that same feeling. I'm like, the like the book is just amazing. I love the illustrations. They're so high quality. And so I immediately reached out to her and I'm like, who like and I was right at the point where I was figuring out like I don't like these illustrations. I want to do something different. And so I reached out to her and she shared with me um DG self-publishing. Um, this company. So they have a team of illustrators that they work with. Um, I never met the illustrator who created, you know, the designs for my book specifically, but um, I worked with a project manager who was the middle person between myself and between the illustration and design team. So um, yeah, they have a full network of um, of illustrators, designers, manuscript editors, a full team of people um, that you can tap into for, for creating the book, wherever you are in the process. Are they expensive? Because that's another question, because people wonder, you have to pay a, like a lump sum. Are yeah. they expensive? It was surely an investment. I will say that. I don't know. Um, I, I honestly don't know in terms of what it costs to illustrate a book, like where they fall in comparison to that. And I feel like that would determine if they're expensive, but, um, I, it was well worth the investment. I will say that. And, and I don't know, like I said, in comparison to what it typically costs or, you know, what that would be, but, um, they're also willing to like, they're a family owned business. And so, there, it feels like you're working with family and it feels like they're just as invested as you are. And so um, they were, you know, able to work with me in terms of not having to pay it all up front, paying it in, in, you know, month over month and things like that. Okay. So I remember you mentioned at the beginning of this chat that it's a series you're working on. So what are you working on next? Because this series is, let me check. I mean, this particular book is called, let me see which because i believe this is the first this is the first book in the series right yes and this so, one is the library quest so this is the library quest so what are the next what are, what's the next book and the next book you're working on in this series yeah so um the series is reflective of like my mom and my son in real life and like all these fun things that they to do that they do together and it's really rooted in the fact that they learn wherever they are, whatever they're doing. They're always learning something new and they're not limited to just math or just history or just reading. And so each book in the series will have a different learning concept. The Library Quest was really focused on reading, the power of reading, the beauty of it. And it was like very heavy 
with a historical context. Um, the next, you know, books in the series will have maybe a science focus. Um, I'm sure that there will be like another history focused book. There will be one um, about learning math and, you know, kind of delve into different subjects. There may even be like a foreign language and things like that. So um, each of them will have a very, you know, cool concept about learning. Um, and then it'll, they'll just focus on different topics and each location will vary, um, you know, in terms of what they're learning and, and what they're doing. I, I keep getting asked the question, like, what will the next book be? And I, I do know what it will be. I have started writing it, um, but I have not shared it yet. Um, it's, it's sort of something I'm holding near and dear right now, but I'm <laughs> super excited about it. Super no, excited okay. about it. <laughs> okay. okay, I mean, that's why, you know, we always say sometimes that when we're working on stuff, don't talk about it until you finish. Yep. Because we always <laughs> feel that it will be jinxed. But sometimes I go, but if you don't talk about it, how will people know what you're working on? Yeah. But, I, but I think that it's always great to to put things out when the time is right. Talk about it yeah. when, when you feel that the time is right. Yeah. So another thing I've noticed is that we don't have enough children's books about African kings and queens. Not at all. Because I'm actually, I started working on one two years ago. I haven't finished it yet. I just thought it would be a great idea to actually have something like that. I've seen a few authors start to do that, focus mm -hmm. on African kings and queens. We don't. When you talk about, when you talk about, you think about ancient heroes and all of that, you are thinking of Thor. Yeah. And Thor is the equivalent of Shango. Mm -hmm. as the African god of thunder, Shongo. I think we don't have enough of that. African kings, queens, Africans, heroes, heroines. Why do you think we don't have enough of that? That is a great question. Um, there may, I mean, for one part, just be, there, there just may not be a lot of information or people just may not have tapped into um, the information regarding these African kings and queens. Um, I think for a while, uh, because there were other people who wanted to change and taint and um, what is it, knock off the noses of these people and, and, you know, just tell their stories in a different way. I think that there might be a little bit of hesitation to challenge those stories um, and to find maybe um, like the truth to be able to really tell those stories. Um, I think that there's been like a lot of intentional hiding of history and yeah. you really got to dig deep and, and search long and hard just to find, you know, a book by someone who is representative of these people. Um, and that is, you know, is telling the truth is, is telling, you know, the history. So I, I don't know. I think that's a great question. I think that's something that I want to look more into even as you know, I continue to write, you know, my own stories and, and maybe even find people, maybe they are writing the stories and maybe they just are not, you know, getting them in front of, like, maybe they're just not in front of us or maybe we're just not aware. Um, but I, I do see pockets of communities that are, are starting to learn this information and starting to research it and, and learn more about it. And so um, maybe those stories will start to see them more frequently as, you know, on the back end of Black Panther and the way that they're being told on these larger networks now. So maybe we will. I did see that there is a Netflix special. I'm not sure if you've seen it. African Queens? Preview. Yes. Yes. I, I think I still watched yes. it day before yesterday, but I got caught up. I haven't. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I saw, I, I saw that. Okay. So how do you think that we can keep... How do you think we can keep our stories authentic? Because we, because remember, publishing is a business. Yeah. So as much as we want to write from our hearts, we also want to write stories that will sell. Right. So yeah, so it's a thin line. So how do you think we can keep our stories authentic? I think it's really important just being aware of your intention and going into it. Like I didn't write a children's book to become rich like this. If I become rich, that'd be great. I will not be mad about that, but mm -hmm. I didn't write it to, you know, become filthy rich off of it. And so um, I think that you've got to just be really, really aware of your intention going into it and making sure that the authenticity of it and the truth telling behind it is at the core of why you're doing it. Um, and that you're not going into it thinking, I want to 
put something out there that's going to sell and that's going to make a bunch of money and that everyone will like. I think that that is where in Hollywood and in media in general, we kind of mess ourselves up because the things that sell are normally raunchy and just distasteful in a way and, and it, it just becomes so tainted. So I think just being, like I said, just extremely aware of your intention and where your heart is positioned when you're creating these stories and telling these stories will really help you kind of keep your eye on the prize and that the authenticity is is really um, what the aim is and, and, you know, staying focused there. I don't think everyone will hit the mark. I think some people will get, uh, you know, lost in the sauce and, and, you know, willing to compromise authenticity for, you know, extra money. But as many of us as possible that can kind of stick, you know, stay the course and, and keep our hearts positioned, you know, in the right way, I think we'll, we'll be successful in that. So what do you hope to see for your books? What do you hope for the future? Yeah, so I was actually talking with someone last night and they were telling me um, that, so it was a dad and a little boy, they were reading the story and um, they were reading the part and he's like, I am a king. And the little boy was like, I am a king. And it just warmed my heart so much. Like it, it just made me so happy. I was smiling ear to ear because that is what I want when you know people read these books. I want them to feel like at the core of who I am or just who I am, like I can do amazing things. Like, you know, just to be empowered. I think with every story that I tell and every book that I create, that is what I want for, for children to walk away and for families to walk away with something that they feel like is a, a good source or good resource to say like, I am amazing. Like I, I am, I am a king. I am a queen. You know, I am, I am just amazing as I am. Um, that really for me is, is what I want is that empowerment, that enlightenment that people have within from reading these stories. Okay. And can you share some tips on writing on good, on, on telling a good children's story? Do you have any yeah. tips? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe somebody is, was listening to this podcast and said, I would like to write a book like Mansa and Yaya. What are yeah. some tips you can share? I think the one thing to think about, you know, we all have an inner child. We all have, we all used to be children one day. And so think about as a child, whether or not you love to read, like think about if you were to open a book, what what would you want to get out of it? Like what would speak to, to your inner child and, and who you were as a kid and make you feel empowered or um, knowledgeable or like you're you're growing in a positive way? I think that's one thing that I thought heavily about as I created this book is like, what is a book that as a kid I would want to see? Um, and then of course, if you have children or, or if you you know have children in your family that you're connected with, think about what is something that you know you would want them to see, or what how would you want them to feel reading a book? So um, I think thinking about you know from a childlike place, how do you feel like this book would empower you or empower other people? Okay. Um, I also think that, I mean, this isn't really part of the writing part of it, but I think thinking about the way that you visualize the book and the illustrations, I think for a children's book, the biggest part, what reels the kids in is, is the illustrations and what the characters look like and what they're doing. And they want to see kids most of the time, I assume having fun or, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, they want to connect with or be doing whatever these characters are doing. Just like when they see people on TV, it's like, I want to do that. I want to, you know, be like that. And so um, just thinking about the visual concepts that you're creating, like making sure that it's something exciting and something fun that, you know, children will um, engage with. And then, yeah, other than that, I feel like, you know, just something that you feel good about. Like it does, I don't think that you have to write a story about a particular topic just because it's trending or just because a lot of people are talking about it. Really think about something that speaks from your heart and, you know, from who you are and then share it with the people around you and see what their thoughts are, what they're thinking, how they're feeling um, and either use the feedback and, and make it different or, or use the feedback and say, this is exactly why I wanna keep this this way. Um, but yeah. Do you think it's important for black authors to tell black stories or you feel that anybody can tell, anybody can tell any story about any culture they choose to? 
I do think it's important for Black people to tell Black stories. Um, I get a little nervous when anyone from, you know, any ethnicity is telling a story of another ethnicity and they, you know, weren't uh, born or grown into that culture or I don't know, it, it just, it becomes a very gray line. Um, I always look at, you know, what the author looks like of any book that I'm reading, because for me, it, I feel like it gives me a little insight into how I'm perceiving this story. And I won't say that I never read books. Um, you know, for instance, if there is a black, uh, story being told, I'm not going to necessarily say that I won't read it. If it's someone not black, I'm probably less likely to, but, um, I don't completely shy away from it, but it does change the perception that I have about the story that I'm reading, um, where there is a lot more trust and a lot more openness, at least for me, when I am reading a story about you know black people or black life and the author is black so i think it, it's it's super important um and i think it's super important even as readers that we're aware of the authors of the books that we're reading and making sure that they're reflective of the communities that you know that they're telling stories about yeah i think it's also very important because no i know that i grew up reading um books by rudyard kipling but uh, he wrote a lot about india but i found out that i think he was born there Okay. And up there, so he went through childhood. So I, I guess he understood the essence of the culture, because I realized that sometimes that for the longest time, black stories were not told by black people, right? And sometimes they were not told right, right? I realized that a lot of indigenous stories that we grew up reading was actually the colonized version of those stories. Mm -hmm. so until I started reading research by authentic research, yeah by us about us for the world i came to understand a lot of things it's like when you read the stories of or even when you when you read stories of egypt and you look at the pictures yeah. and you see old movies like cleopatra ben Hur, all those old movies mm -hmm. that's not what the ancient egyptians look like right they looked more like you and me and i remember realizing and learning the truth mm -hmm. of you know what those people looked like and i just felt ashamed because i'm like how did i really believed this like i yeah. mean <laughs> I, I was mad at myself for, for believing yeah. i you was know, watching that. i remember i think i was watching cleopatra and i think it was elizabeth taylor with all the kajal around her eyes and i was like i was just wondering couldn't you just get a black actress to do this you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you look at yeah, all the stories that had been told, you know, when I I write for adults, but I decided to also try my hand at writing for children. Mm -hmm. I, I like history, so my stories are usually historical based. My the name of my series is Africa is not a country series. Okay. So because people make that mistake a lot, you know, you just hear people go, oh, so I went to Africa, and I right. go, excuse me, what country did you visit? Right. Oh, yes, from my accent, you can tell I am Nigeria. You t you can't change history, but you can make things right. Right. Yeah, you can choose. When I decided to start to write children's books, I my series is called like I mentioned before, Africa is not a country. I'll mm -hmm. show it, I'll show it to you. So this is this is the book too. This is the African safari. Yeah. So yeah, because a lot of children don't realize that. Um, Tigers and yes. tigers are not indigenous to Africa. I know those days we used to have Tarzan and where he would fight right. off like that. Yeah. So I this love that. Is, yeah, this one is this is an introduction to Africa to Africa's indigenous animals. And then I have this was the very first one I put I wrote in that series, Crowning Glory. I love so, that. Yeah. This one is a history of African hair tradition. So where I am teaching children that a lot of hairstyles you have mm -hmm. today was in, actually was inspired by a lot of African hairstyles. Yep. Because, you see, people tell history the way they want to tell it. But exactly. trust me, when I look at the Bantu knots, you see this? Yes. Yes, but trust me, when I look at the Bantu knots and the thick leaf on, on the head of the Buddha and yes. those thick leaves, I just, I smile. <laughs> and I go, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you guys said what that is the heart right yeah. <laughs> yeah so i always go mm -hmm. you guys said that um it's a hat but right we all know that it's only one hair type that can do bantu knots and uh 
that are here. Right. Whatever story people choose to believe, fine. Even in the artifacts that they find, with the reddish skin, the very black yeah. skin, people have comfortably told all kinds of stories. When you find the, the sphinx with the nose like mine, they break them off, comfortably break them off. Yep. You know what? You still keep finding out. Even braids, the braids that were found on, I mean, at uh, what? The, is it Saqqara in Egypt? I can't remember what it is. But they found that. Yeah. Yeah. So I always go, hmm, well, it, I think it's important we tell our stories. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and because it's interesting I'm because, right. and you know, the famous quote of everything done in the dark comes to light. Right, yes. And you cannot hide it or change it, but for so long, mm-hmm. um, you, you can't hide, but so much, like you can't change or taint, but so much. Um, cause now you've got, you know, a world of authors like you and I, who are coming back to tell these stories and to tell the truth and, um, and to teach children. Yeah. It's like when I saw Nefertiti, I saw the original and I saw the one the world has been, has seen for the past, what, 50 years. Yeah. I was in shock. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's practically no nose on <laughs> what we're seeing today. Yeah, because I wonder, I go, if you have nothing to hide. Right. Yes. Why change everything? Right. Why try to why try to change a narrative? We already we know the truth and we are learning the truth. Why try to change a narrative to make yourself look Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask you for people, those of you living in the US, so I don't know how it works there if it's the same as it is in Canada, but what challenges do black authors experience when trying to come together? Do you guys as black authors work together to promote your books? Do do things like do you guys do things like that? Yeah, I will say I am I feel like I'm fairly new to the author community and and like what it looks like for me to connect with authors. It has been a pretty positive experience lately. Um or just like in lately as if I've been doing it for a while. Um but just as I've been doing it, it has been a pretty positive experience in that Um, you know, if I follow someone on Instagram, like they follow me back or they'll reshare my post or they'll have something going on where it's like, we can partner together and we can do something together to promote each other's work. Um, I feel like it's been pretty positive for the most part. I haven't really had any negative interaction or any, what I feel like is like someone is like personally trying to compete or trying to, um, you know, do anything negative. So I I think it's positive for the most part. It's pretty easy to connect. I think in the world of social media, it's easy to say, hey, look at this story. Like this is, you know, cool. And, you know, a story that um, is about representation and telling black stories and represents, um, you know, the black community as well. I think it's been a pretty positive um, community of, of authors. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. I think and that's what I was going to say. Thank you for creating this space and, and for creating your own stories because I I would have loved to open up a book like those books that you oh. as a kid. Like, would have loved that. Um, this was bad. I was getting a relaxer as a little girl. I would have loved to open a book and see oh, all these beautiful God. natural hairstyles. Guys, I was listening to a guy yesterday and he said, stop calling these locks, dreadlocks. Call it yeah. ether. Just yeah. call it ether. Because so I read about Medusa. I remember Medusa. They said Medusa had hair of snake, mm-hmm. head of snakes. snakes and yeah. someone later said, no, she had locks. Mm. They didn't know what locks were. So they assumed they, it was snake. Right. And wow. I was like, oh, I never thought of that. And think about how prominent this concept of her having a head full of snakes is of now. Snakes. What? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's a possibility she was black and she just had locks. And yeah. they didn't know what locks were at that time. And they yeah. just and that story has been passed on for years. Yeah. You just sit comfortably and say, Oh yeah, she had who has a head of snakes for the love of God? Who right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh well, once again, Naya, thank you so so much for yes, joining thank us. Thank you. Yes, for this amazing chat. So yeah. if people want to buy your books, where can they find your books to buy? Yes, so it is available on Amazon. You can purchase it there. And it's also available on my website, advmansayaya.com. 
Um, and so purchasing from my website, you can receive a signed copy. If you're purchasing from Amazon, you'll it won't be signed um, because it'll come directly from um, Amazon. But yeah, you can get it in either of those places.